year ago, the people from Puerto Rico may have thought that verse was written for them. And most recently, the people in the Bahamas may feel that was written for them. And there are times in your life when you may feel that's written for you. I invite you to open to 1 Peter chapter 2. And verse 11, as Peter is writing to people who are dealing with problems and challenges because of their faith. 1 Peter chapter 2, the 11th verse. It says, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to keep away from fleshly desires that do battle against the soul and maintain good conduct among non-Christians so that though they now malign you as wrongdoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God when he appears. So Peter is writing to Christians who live in Rome where persecution is extreme. And when he refers to them as foreigners, he's not talking about geography. He's saying they are foreigners because they've accepted the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they're being rejected by family and friends and neighbors and loved ones. And he encourages them, as he encourages us, to be faithful in the midst of trials. To trust God regardless. Let me illustrate it this way. There was summer camp. And at the summer camp, there was an inspirational speaker. And the summer camp was a prelude to the football preseason, the high school preseason. And the inspirational speaker said, through Jesus, you can be winners and not losers. Well, the football players really related to that because they wanted to be winners. And so the entire football team came forward when a call was made to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And the next Sunday they were in church and they said to the pastor, we're here. And we're going to have a great season because Jesus is on our side and we can't lose. Because Jesus makes winners and not losers. Well, their first game they won. They were feeling pretty good. They figured Jesus suited up with them. The next seven games of the season, they lost. It wasn't long before those football players stopped going to church, stopped declaring a relationship with Jesus. They determined that for some reason, Jesus wasn't, either Jesus wasn't suiting up for their team or he was suiting for the other team. But it is true that in Jesus, we become winners. But not in the way that the world thinks of winners. Jesus said that the only way to win is to lose. And Jesus Christ himself lost his life so that he could win us. He is the ultimate winner. He won by paying the highest price possible. And he calls us to be his disciples. Even if that means paying a high price. Amen. If you're following Christ for selfish reasons and you're unwilling to surrender your life unconditionally to Him, you will be a loser. On the other hand, if you're ready to lose your life for His sake, you are ultimately a winner. As Peter moves into his letter, Moving from the second chapter to the fourth chapter. Again, verse 7, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. The end of the world is coming soon. First century Christians were clinging to the hope and the idea that in their lifetime they would see Jesus come. Isn't that what we're doing? Clinging that within our lifetime we'll see Jesus come. He said, Therefore, be earnest. And discipline in your prayers. Now, if you're reading the King James Bible, it says, be sober. We don't talk like that. We don't say, be sober. We say, be earnest. Be committed. Be determined. And this is what Peter's saying. As a Christian, as a believer in Jesus Christ, be committed. And throughout this, this chapter, Peter's talking about a walk with the Lord. 
And he says, the world may not understand you, may not appreciate you. Because they've not spent time in the Word. There's a TV program called Jeopardy where they ask questions and people get paid to answer it. They asked a question, I just caught the last minute of it. They asked the question, what country is Goliath from? I thought, that's a pretty easy question. And their answer is always in a question. And all three of them gave the same answer. Who's Goliath? The world doesn't understand our perspective, our biblical perspective. And that's what Peter's trying to say in, in chapter 4, that even though the world doesn't understand, live your life to the glory of God, so that somewhere along the line, your neighbors are going to say to you, I'd like to know more about this God of yours. Because the world is coming to an end. And so he says, be earnest. And then he says, be people of prayer. You know, the, the vision statement we have up here, the only way we can walk together in Christ is to be prayer warriors, mm -hmm. to be committed to prayer in our personal life as well as our corporate experience. Amen. And he says, pray. And then he goes on, he says, we're to show love to one another. Verse 8, he says, we are to show love one to another. I was talking to a funeral director a few years ago. And he told me about a young lady who, whose father had passed away and then recently her mother had passed. And she was there and she was standing by the gravesite and they were making sure that the tombstones were done correctly. And she had tears in her eyes. And she said, because there's a third, a lot. But that she was not going to be able to be buried next to her parents. And, the, and he asked her what she meant by that. She because I have tattoos. And for a, there are a variety of issues that within the Jewish custom do not allow you to be buried in their cemeteries. One of those tattoos. And he said to her, if you don't tell them, I won't tell them. <laughs> we'll bury you there next to your parents. But you know what's great about the resurrection? All our mistakes are washed away. Amen. When, we, when, when God raises the dead in Christ from their graves, it's all gone. All of our mistakes. And then he says that we're to have that kind of love. Unconditional love for one another. And that's part of our mission statement. Walking together in Christ means that we will love each other. That we're empowered to love each other. And then in verse 9, he says that we're to use our homes as cities of refuge. Isn't that a neat picture? The world may be horrible out there, but in this home, you're safe. In verses 10 through 11, Peter says that we're to use the spiritual gifts that God has given to us. Both our spiritual gifts and our natural talents, or to use them to honor His name and to glorify Him. You know, this church, though it may be small, it is amazing the number of ministries that are taking place in this church. If you're a visitor, you probably don't know that there's an active prison ministry going on in this church. There is an active food pantry. Lynn. How many families? Uh, yeah, 50, about 50 families. Okay. Oh, 50 families come twice a month for extra substance to meet their needs. And then Wendy, there's the Christmas store. We're back in negotiations with the hospital to meet the needs of families who aren't going to have a very good Christmas. And someone doesn't step in and help out. There's the Tuesday night study groups, the Wednesday afternoon study groups. Peter says, use your gifts to the glory of God. And I would say, we need to use them while we still can. Amen. In verse 12, he says, friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you're going through 
as if something strange were happening to you. In other words, Peter is saying this, don't say to yourself, what's wrong with me? Why are all these things happening to me? What am I doing wrong? Or the reverse side is, what's wrong with me that I'm not having trials? He was just staying focused on Jesus. The trials will come soon enough. And I've heard people say, well, if, we, if maybe we had trials, we'd be more spiritual. Well, all the evidence out there indicates quite the, on, on, quite the contrary. What makes us more spiritual is a walk with Jesus Christ. Amen. Not trials. In verses 50 through 60, he says, Rejoice. And, and, and then he goes on and says, Do not be ashamed. And in verse 16 through 18, he says, Glorify God. And finally, he says, Commit your life to God. If we want to be ready, for the soon coming of Jesus, we must be willing to commit our lives to God. Not so we can win a football game, but so that we can be on the winning team. So that on the resurrection of the morning, whether we're the dead in Christ or the living in Christ, that we spend eternity together with Jesus. That's our long, that's the long, long view. Not the short view, the long view is spending eternity with Jesus Christ. Which means dedicating our lives and, and as often as possible rededicating our lives. So this morning, as a, as a corporate body, we're going to recommit our lives to Jesus Christ. So we can walk together in Christ through prayer, through love, through health, and through sharing. And we do that through the communion service. And we begin that as, as a practice of Seventh-day Adventists, is the foot washing service. Now some of you, especially some of you who are guests, they say, oops, I didn't put this foot washing service, I'm not really ready. Don't worry about that. You're more than welcome to participate, but you're also welcome to remain in your pews and, and, uh, and spend time with the Lord, as those who are prepared will participate. The men and the family units will go to the fellowship hall. We're going to do a little experiment here this time. And the ladies will go to the education wing to the blue door. Everybody clear? Men and couples and families will go to the fellowship hall. This is right. And then the ladies will go to the next to the last door, to the blue door, which is the education wing. So let's pray. Father Heaven, thank you that you give us this beautiful service to rededicate our lives to you in a, in a, in a very small sense, a rebaptism in our life. And I pray, Father, this will be the highlight of our day. In Jesus' name, Amen. So, um,